The Lord is our light and our salvation. The Lord is the stronghold of our lives. God will shelter us on any day of trouble and set us high upon a rock. Let God's people shout for joy, for Christ calls us as his own. Let us worship the Lord our God this day. Welcome to this time of worship with the St. Andrew's Church community. There are a few brief announcements that we wanted to share with you as we begin this online service. The first is that this coming Wednesday, January the 24th, there will be a special Heart of the City speaker series event here at the church, which will begin at 7 o'clock in the evening. Our guest will be Dr. Patrick Brace, who is a friend of the congregation and is presently doing some postdoctoral work at New York University. Patrick is going to be sharing some of the amazing discoveries that are being made through data and images collected by the Webb and Hubble telescope programs. It uh, promises to be a wonderful evening, and everyone is encouraged to join us for this beautiful speaker series event. More details can be found on the church website at www.standrewstoronto.org. On Sunday, January the 28th, we will be having a short congregational meeting following the service for the purpose of reviewing and approving the congregational budget for the 2024 year. Everyone is also welcome and encouraged to be here for that meeting and to participate in this important conversation about the life and ministry of our church community in the coming year. There's one final announcement before we begin the service, uh, offered by Candy Grant, who is the chairperson of the search committee for the associate minister position here at St. Andrews. So over to Candy. Hello, I'm Candy Grant. I'm chair of the search committee, looking for the new associate minister at St. Andrews. The session has asked me to speak with you today on two perspectives. One, to give you an update on the search process and how it's going, but also to ask for your help. You would have heard from our interim moderator, Reverend Emily Bissett, in the middle of November, when she preached at St. Andrews to say that the position has been declared open. Since then, we've posted the position description both in the central church, uh, with the central church, and also on our own website. And the search committee in the new year is beginning to process applications. 
We're hoping to begin the face-to-face -face interview process in the February time frame and have a recommended candidate by the end of April or May. This, of course, depends on us being able to identify what we think is a suitable candidate for St. Andrews. This is where you can help, and I, I'm wondering if you wouldn't give consideration to Presbyterian ministers that you know or ministers that are eligible for ordination into the Presbyterian Church that you think would be a good fit for St. Andrews. You can send those suggestions directly to Reverend Emily Bissett. The position description is on our website and included in that is Emily's contact information. And we know that those of us that are involved in the congregation have got a good idea of who we are. We've seen the strategic plan, we know where we're going, and um, we're hoping that there will be some good suggestions coming from members of the congregation. And in closing, I ask you to keep the members of the search committee in your prayers. This is a very important task that they're undertaking and it really is contributing to this future success of St. Andrews. Thank you. Thank you for listening. God of light and truth, we open ourselves to your presence with us this day. We give you thanks for the gift of life, both of mortal life and of the eternal life that we await in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of your forgiving love, in which we have found hope for the future and peace from the sins of the past. We give thanks for the gift of faith, for the ongoing journey towards your kingdom that you call us on. We pray, O oh God, that you would keep us faithful as we strive to seek your face and your presence and your kingdom in this world. Lord God, even as we bow before you, we do so uh, burdened down by our sins. We know that we have failed to serve and obey you. We have ignored your presence. We have relied upon our own power and pride to find satisfaction and contentment in life. In turning away from you, we have failed you and each other and even ourselves. And so in the silence of this time, O oh God, both convict us of our sin and allow us once again to know the reality and the power of your forgiving and saving grace. Hear our silent confessions, O oh God. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Renew us and transform us by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that this time and our very lives may be wholeheartedly and joyfully dedicated to you and to your will for us in this world. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever. Amen. The first lesson is being read from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5 and verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up! Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I will tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Thus ended the first lesson. Psalm 62, verses 5 to 12. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge, is in God. 
Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion, and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Gospel lesson is taken from the first chapter of the Gospel according to Mark, verses 14 to 20. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Of all of the great technological innovations of our time, perhaps amongst the most helpful are those handy GPS systems that we find on our smartphones and in our cars these days. To punch in a, an address as we set out and receive a clear set of directions really is a huge aid to helping us to find our way. Most of us probably remember the days of trying to unfold a map or flip through a book of maps and then to have the frustrating task of trying to refold the map along the various crease lines so that it would fit once again into the glove compartment. Well, those days are gone. Now, within seconds, instead, we are provided with a suggested route, a fairly accurate estimate of the amount of time that it's going to, get, to take to get us there by foot or car or public transit, and even some indication of places along the route where we might encounter slowdowns due to heavy traffic or accidents or construction, which in Toronto these days seems to pop up on every possible route from anywhere we are to anywhere that we want to go. It is really all quite helpful, though. But the irritating part is that on some phones and car navigation systems, there's that seemingly calm voice patiently alerting us to when we should begin to prepare for a turn in order to stay on the suggested route. In 250 meters, turn left. And in spite of the guidance, there are times when we miss the turn or take the wrong road, and suddenly the whole system has to start to recalculate how we get where we want to go. A modified route is suggested with the goal of getting us back on track as quickly as possible at other times, and particularly when we're in some area where we need to get back to some exact point, such as a bridge entrance or a specific on-ramp, the voice and navigation system gives us very little choice or options, not a suggestion inviting us to simply reroute ourselves, but a more pointed turnaround. I remember one occasion when I had keyed in a destination and was well underway, but then realized that I had to go off the selected route for an errand. I made what was the correct turn for the errand, but the voice kept trying to find ways to get me to turn around to get back on track. At every corner, at every intersection, there was the encouragement to make a U-turn where it was possible or to turn around so that I could reroute myself in the opposite direction and get back to the route that I had told the machine that I wanted to be on. The voice in the car system never scolded or judged or condemned my wayward behavior, but neither did it give up on trying to provide guidance to get me back on the road that I needed to be on to get where I had told it that I wanted to go. As I did not know how to easily or quickly turn off the voice while driving, I found myself chuckling as I half expected the generated voice to start to sound perturbed and frustrated as I got further and further off the correct route. I said, turn around. I was expecting it to say, did you not hear me? You're going the wrong way. Turn back already, you dolt. 
eventually not knowing how to turn off the navigation mid-route, I did the next easiest thing. I just turned down the volume so that I wouldn't have to listen to that voice anymore. Now, as spiritual metaphors go, bear with me. After all, my suggestion is not that we stop listening when a certain voice is trying to give us clear and helpful guidance when we start to wander in ways that might lead us to get lost. Rather, I would invite us instead to realize that there may be an intriguing parallel between those helpful modern technological navigational devices and today's reading from the Gospel of Mark. Consider. Today's passage is set close to the beginning of Mark's gospel and recounts the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. He had been to see John the Baptist at the Jordan River and been baptized by him. He had spent 40 days and nights in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. We read that John had been arrested, which for some reason signaled that Jesus' ministry was now set to begin. And begin it did with a call to repentance. In fact, these are the first words that are placed on the lips of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This word repentance, or metanoia in the Greek, is a word that conveys an invitation to turn around, to reroute our journey, to get back on track. Often when we hear people calling for repentance, what might come most quickly to our minds is some judgmental street corner evangelist calling for a groveling self-flagellation in light of our wretched sinfulness because the end is near. But this invitation to repentance does not need to be heard in such a tone of judgment and condemnation. Rather, it might more helpfully be compared with the voice of that navigational aid that we rely on when we go for a drive these days, and particularly to those moments when we get off course and need to turn around in order to get ourselves back on track to the destination that we told the device that we would like to get to. So what then, we might ask, is the intended destination, the goal of our journey? For some, the longed-for destination is described in relation to the dream or hope of some heavenly existence, both in, either in this world or in the next. But for all of us, our intended destination does convey, in one way or another, something of that heavenly vision. That is, we all want to make our way towards lives that are free of the burdens and worries that weigh us down, we want our lives and our world to know the blessing of peace and abundance and justice and contentment. We want our lives and the lives of our loved ones to arrive in that place marked by meaning and purpose and fulfillment and freedom from mourning and crying and pain. We want to live in a world in which God's love does reign over all in which our world and our lives are set free from the brokenness and strains and uncertainties and anxieties and estrangements that seem so much a part of the human condition. We want to taste and see the fullness of beauty and harmony and joy and happiness that surely must be God's intentions for life. The Bible describes that longed-for, dreamed-of existence in many ways. It is the vision of a harmonious existence that lay at the heart of the story of the Garden of Eden. It was the poetic vision that the people were told of the promised land. It was the proclamation that the kingdom of God was near, that the kingdom of heaven had come to this world. It was the dream of a new heaven and a new earth in the pages of Revelation. It's what we ask for every time that we pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's where we would like to get to. That's where we would like to arrive at in this life. But we know that we're not there yet, and we might need a bit of help sometimes to find our way to that intended destination. And Jesus' first words in today's reading from the Gospel of Mark suggest that he had come to do exactly that, to help us to find the way. After all, Jesus' words suggested that the kingdom of God was near, if his listeners had the eyes to see, the faith to ask or knock, the willingness to follow him, the determination to strive beyond all else to find that kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, 
he said. But he also knew that we as humans sometimes get off track on our way to that longed-for destination. We start heading in the wrong direction, and that's why his proclamation that the kingdom of God was near was accompanied by a call for repentance, an invitation to turn around, to turn back, to allow our lives to be rerouted so that we could get to where we want to go. Is that how we hear such words inviting us to repentance? Not always. Too often we hear such calls in that tone of judgment and condemnation, repent you sinners, but perhaps we're wise to try to hear Jesus' words not in that tone of harsh condemnation, but rather in the same way that we hear the voice on the car's navigation system, a calm voice, simply inviting us and summoning us and encouraging us to reorient ourselves on the journey, to reroute our lives back towards the pathway that will lead us where we need to and deeply want to get to. The kingdom of God is near, said Jesus. The dream is close, but trust me, believe me, you are a bit off track. Turn around, turn back, repent, Reroute, few course corrections, and you'll be back to, on that journey towards that dream, that vision, that hope, that kingdom that has, in fact, come near. So when is it that we most need to listen to that voice of direction? When is it that we need to hear that voice of correction to respond to that call to repentance? Well, we need to do so when the ways that we are heading in this life are not leading us towards the fulfillment of that dream. When our attitudes do not align with the loving kindness and compassion that God longs for us to experience and extend to others. When our actions and priorities are motivated by goals and destinations other than those which will lead us towards that wondrous vision. When our words and preoccupations have nothing to do with the fulfillment of that vision of a wondrous kingdom, it can be good in those moments to hear Jesus' voice, which comes to us in our conscience and in the words of Scripture and in the words of others, calling us, comforting us, challenging us, inviting us to turn around, to reroute our lives, to repent. And everything that comes after that proclamation in the Gospel of Mark serves to illustrate in Jesus' life, what the right path looked like and what effects it would have on the world. After all, we can look at the life of Jesus as it's presented and recounted in the Gospels as an illustration of what that envisioned goal would and should look like in this world. After all, in his presence, the hungry were fed and the sick were healed. In his presence, outcasts were restored to community, and those with broken and tormented spirits were set free from that which was troubling them. In his presence, those who were judged and found wanting, wanting were embraced and celebrated. In his presence, food and friendship and life were celebrated. In his presence, those who used power for unethical purposes were challenged. And weak and weary people were held up and given rest and restored to dignity. In his presence, even hatred and suffering and death fell away in the presence of his love and life and resurrection. In his presence, life as it was meant to be was able to flourish and rise up, never to be overcome. And that is the where that he would like to lead all of us. That is the intended destination that he'd like to guide us towards. That is the goal for which he calls us to return when our lives get distracted and off course. That's, I think, what he meant when he called us to repent. May we hear that voice. May we respond to it. And in so doing, may we get on with this journey that is going to lead us to life and to love and to God. Thanks be to God, and Amen.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go and do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God in all that you do. And may the love of Almighty God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the comfort and friendship of God's Holy Spirit bless you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.